The Bob Murphy Show, episode 248. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today we're going to be talking with Jacob Hornberger. Let me go ahead and just read from his official bio, and then I'll talk more about what he and I are talking about. So Jacob Hornberger is founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, often abbreviated as FFF, and then .org. He was born and raised in Laredo, Texas, and received his BA in economics from Virginia Military Institute and his law degree from the University of Texas. He was a trial attorney for 12 years in Texas. He also was an adjunct professor at the University of Dallas, where he taught law and economics. In 1987, Mr. Hornberger left the practice of law to become director of programs at the Foundation for Economic Education. He has advanced freedom and free markets on talk radio stations all across the country, as well as on Fox News's Neil Cavuto and Greta Van Susteren shows, and he appeared as a regular commentator on Judge Andrew Napolitano's show, Freedom Watch. So what Jacob and I are talking about in this episode, he has been writing some stuff recently, and this is a position he's held for a while, and we, we get into this in the in conversation, but he is against libertarians supporting school vouchers. And so that's, you know, and that's also my, my view. Um, so Jacob's particular, uh, objections, you know, I endorse them, but you know, the, the, the things he brings up, if you ask him what's the problem with, with so-called school choice from a libertarian perspective, you know, he might emphasize things differently from the way I would have. And, but still, I, I thought this was interesting. So I wanted to have him on just so you know, as I often do in these discussions, I tried to anticipate, okay, people in the audience who are disagreeing or thinking this guest is missing something big, let me speak for them. All right, so don't be confused if, if it looks like in this interview I keep stopping Jacob to, to object. It's not because that's personally my view necessarily, but more that I want to uh, let him give the most robust defense of his position, even though I happen to agree with it. Uh, if you're interested, remember that I had Corey DeAngelis on, let me see when that was, that was episode 105. So if you want to see my interview with Corey DeAngelis, who makes the case for what he calls school choice, then you want to go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 105. But right now you're listening to bobmurphyshow.com slash 248, my interview with Jacob Hornberger. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Jacob. Well, Jacob, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Thank you, Bob. Great to be here with you. So I have known of you and your work for a long time, of course, but for the benefit of perhaps younger listeners who may not be familiar with you, uh, do, do you want to just give a little bit of background of you know your organizational pedigree and and you know your your place in the liberty movement? Let's call it. Sure, uh, I founded the. Future of Freedom Foundation some 32 years ago. I continue to serve as president. And my objective from the beginning was to have a, an educational foundation that presented the principled, uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy, especially in the context of the burning issues of the day. Uh, so that rather than just having esoteric articles like on minimum wage or so forth, we would uh, generally take an uh, issue that's in the news and analyze it from a libertarian perspective, but with the idea of never advocating reform measures, reforming the welfare state or reforming the warfare state, but always making the case for the genuinely free society. In, in other words, identifying what the infringements on our liberty are, and then making the case for abolishing, repeal, dismantling, as compared to simply reforming, fixing, and improving them. And so we've been doing that for 32 years. We've addressed just about every single aspect of the libertarian philosophy. We have a FFF daily that we have strived for 20 years to make the best libertarian commentary page on the internet. That's for free. We have a monthly journal called Future of Freedom. That's by subscription, $25 a year. I think it's 15 by email. And we have conferences, uh, multiple seminars and stuff. All the videos are there on our website at fff.org. And uh, so that's what we do. We, we, we make the case for the free society. Okay, great. So you don't have to name names, of course, but am I taking it that partly what you saw back when you founded it was that you were concerned that too often the advocates for liberty 
sort of threw in the towel at the outset and conceded that, oh, yes, of course, we got to have these, you know, government programs in place. But what we're saying is we can, you know, be 12 percent more efficient. Absolutely. I mean, I I looked around the libertarian movement and I saw many libertarians throwing in the towel, as you put it, and saying we just have to make the case for reform. And and they would couch it in terms of advancing liberty. Say, well, we're advancing liberty with this, this reform. But they really weren't because when you reform an infringement on freedom, you're leaving it intact. And if you leave an infringement on liberty intact, you're not achieving freedom. Now, is it more difficult to make the case for freedom? Of course. Uh, But if we're going to achieve a free society, and that's what FFF is devoted to, you got, there are no shortcuts. You've got to, to do the hard work of making the case for the genuinely free society rather than the rather simple case of convincing people to simply adopt or embrace uh, some minor reform of some welfare state program or warfare state program. Well, you you said interestingly there that it's it's perhaps harder to make the case for, you know, full-blown consistent liberty rather than the reform. But I guess it it depends what you mean by that. So if if it means like convincing 80% of the public right now to to agree with you, then I I agree with that. But I found also... um, and there's a sense in which the more consistent position is easier to defend because then you don't have to make ad hoc arbitrary qualifications. You know, in other words, if you're if you're applying some pretty hardcore principle on one little issue, but then you don't want to take it to its logical conclusion, the critics, especially like if they're left wingers, will just say, "What? But are you for this then?" Like, and say something that they think is outrageous. And if you say, "Well, no, I'm not saying that." then it looks like, okay, you're just kind of hodgepodge. You don't actually believe the principle that you are enunciating. Whereas if you just say, yes, I, I am for, you know, completely getting rid of whatever it is, you know, government-owned bridges or something, then then at least they, you're consistent and you can make the point more logically. I totally agree with you. That, that once you. Once you start making the case consistently for liberty, it does become easier in that sense. Uh, what I meant is that well, you know, I've gotten to the point after doing this for so many years that I really don't think it's possible to convince anyone to to become libertarians or to adopt libertarian principles. And the reason I say that is because I have family members who are ardent conservatives, mm-hmm. and and they understand what we do here at FFF, and they're just ardently opposed to it. They're not libertarians, and these are people that love me as family members. I I've decided over the years that what we're really doing, uh, those of us that are making the genuine case for liberty, is we're looking for people like us. It's a discovery process. And that if we're going to discover those people, you, you've you got to be making this principal case uh, because they're not going to be attracted to, to the reform case. And that's what happened with me. I mean, I discovered libertarianism because I came across a series of books that had been published some 20 years before that made the hardcore, pure, principled, uncompromising case for liberty, at least from an economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that just, it was so powerful for me that I could feel the the inches of indoctrination just cracking apart. And I began understanding why there is so much crisis and chaos in the world. A good example I like to use is slavery. That if we had lived in 1855 Alabama, it would be difficult to make the case for freedom. Um, simply because of the temper of the times. Uh, my hunch is that libertarians, if they were living at that time or if they got magically transported there, would, would find it very difficult. They, they might say, well, especially the reform-oriented libertarians today that want to reform our serfdom society, they, they would say, Jacob, it, it's just too difficult. Nobody's going to buy this. Everybody's in favor of slavery here. And uh, we've got to just settle for reform. Anyway, it's in the Constitution. So we're going to have uh, advocacy groups for fewer lashings, better work conditions, better health care, all of which the slaves would appreciate. Mm-hmm. But it wouldn't be freedom. That, that I would argue that what we as libertarians would have needed to do is just stand fast, no matter how difficult, no matter how much criticism we got from people, we would have to stand fast for making the case for for freedom, which necessarily entails making the case for dismantling slavery, not reforming it. And and the arguments for dismantling are oftentimes totally different from the arguments for reform. So just because a libertarian knows how to make the arguments for reform 
doesn't necessarily mean at all that he knows how to make the arguments for freedom, for dismantling these infringements. And that's what I meant, that oftentimes the case for making the freedom arguments much more difficult, not only because you're, you're getting adverse reaction from people, but also because the arguments are, are very much different from the arguments for reform. Well, it's ironic that you brought up the slavery example because I was going to bring that up myself and then say like, I don't know if you, you know, if this is too provocative or something, but so you, you went right there. Cause it, yeah, that's, I think most people today would recognize it would be sort of silly for, you know, like in other words, there was a role for the just flat out abolitionist writers back then to just make the case that no slavery is a moral evil. There's no way to do slavery, right? You just, you can't have it period. And that it, it, and it's true. It meant, you know, it, in many places, you know, there was like a compensated emancipation and so forth. And so it's, but the, the people making, it was important that those people were making that case that if everybody had just adopted the, you know, well, we got to be practical here. And there's a lot of, you know, money tied up in these, in this property and blah, 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 that it would be hard to like have your, your bearings and to know like what, what's the, what's the goal that we're striving towards. Exactly. I mean, it's a matter of right and wrong. I mean, you you, you got to stand for what's right, regardless of what the public sentiment is. Okay. So I think probably most listeners, uh, libertarian or not, get it when it comes to slavery and I get what your point is. But now we, we come to what's called school choice. And I don't even like that labeling. Like, I think that that's, you know, you, you wouldn't say car choice to refer to a program where the government gives tax dollars to people and they can go get, have vouchers to get new cars. Um, uh, or at least libertarians wouldn't call it car choice. They would, you know, they would balk at such, such labeling. But when it comes to that, and I've found Jacob, maybe you've noticed this too. There is no other issue in which people like quote on my side, come at me and think I'm just being obtuse than when I would say, you know, I don't like the marketing that's behind the school vouchers programs coming from, you know, right wingers or libertarians. Um, so let, you've been writing a lot on this recently. So, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and just pause in here and let you explain, you know, to a libertarian who thinks, no, I mean, you know, Milton Friedman, all these big guns are for it. Like, well, you yeah, know, we're taking money away from the monopoly state and we're, we're, we're infusing it in the private sector. And these, these are clearly better. We're, we're just giving parents the choice. They can keep their kid in the public school if they want. So it's not hurting the kids any, right? So what, what's wrong with that line of thinking? Yeah, I share your sentiments about the, the use of the word choice. Uh, they, they say, well, when parents get these vouchers, they have choices. And so we're going to call it school choice. They can choose to go into the private school system or choose to stay in the public school system. Well, in a, in a sense, the welfare recipient, every welfare recipient has choices. I mean, he's, he's got more money at, at his disposal. And so we can say that that's based on choice. In, in fact, we can even say that a a thief has choices that when he when he steals the money and he walks away with it, uh, he's got a lot of choices on what to do with that thousand dollars now. Uh, what we what we have to do is we have to analyze exactly what's going on here. And this is uh, what voucher proponents are loath to do. Uh, vouchers are really based on the same socialist principle as public or what we call government right, school. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, what, the, the public school system, I, I think it would be difficult to find a better example of a socialist system than public schooling. You've got uh, a central board planning the, the educational decisions of millions or thousands or hundreds of, of students. It's a top-down command and control system. It's political. The, the attendance is mandatory through compulsory attendance laws. The, the funding is through coercive taxation. And so it, it shouldn't surprise anybody why there, this educational system is in such chaos, such crisis, it's such a mess, because this is what socialism do, does. I mean, socialism has been the bane of mankind. The problem is that a lot of Americans don't, are, are, don't want to recognize it as a socialist system because most Americans don't like socialism, but so they, they want to label the public schooling just system is just part of America's so-called free enterprise system. But the fact is that it's a gigantic socialist system. So they're, they're, what is the solution to this? Well, the libertarian solution is, well, just get government out of education entirely, a free market in education. I mean, at the, at the center of libertarian philosophy is the free market in terms of economics, at least. 
Uh, the, the free market produces the best of everything. And, and from a moral standpoint, why shouldn't people be free to decide the education of their children the same way that they're free to decide the, the religion of their, of their children? We don't put government in charge of religion or churches. We, we rely on the free market there. Uh, why not do the same? Now, at the center of the libertarian philosophy, as you know, is what is called a non-aggression principle. Um, that principle holds that it's morally wrong to initiate force against someone else. That's why we condemn like murder and rape and stealing and burglary and fraud, because you're, you're, you're transgressing on somebody else. You're violating somebody else's rights. But if there's no force or fraud, libertarians say anything goes, anything that's peaceful. Um, well, so obviously a separating of school and state is consistent with that non-aggression principle because people are now engaged in a peaceful activity under free market principles. Entrepreneurs are buying to give people the, the choices of what educational vehicle is best for each of their children. Parents are managing this. Well, what happened is, is that conservatives, again, as we were talking about earlier, found that's just too difficult. And you find this among many libertarians now, where that it sort of have imported the, the conservative view into the libertarian movement and say, you know, separating school and state is just too hard. It's too difficult. People are not ready for that. And I hear that all the time. People are not ready for that. Mm -hmm. And so they say, we have to settle for reform. And the reform comes in, this, in the form of school vouchers. Well, but school vouchers are based on the same socialist principle. You're take as public schooling. You're taking money by force through taxation from a people to whom it rightly belongs, and you're giving it to people who supposedly needed more. I mean, this is this is this is what socialism does. Uh, it's Marx saying, "From each according to a, his ability, each according to his need," and it's justified by saying, "Oh, well, these these children are suffering in public schools, and it's right to give them something over here." Well. We object to that. It's, it's a form of political stealing. You know, is it is it right for a thief to hold up somebody in the dark alley because his mother needs an operation? He's going to use the money for the operation. We would all recognize that as thievery. You, you can ask people for help, but to force them to help. And then the, the other argument that the voucher proponents say is, uh, well, uh, th th this is a way to improve the system. Uh, now, Milton Friedman used to say, well, this is a gradual way to reach what we're trying to reach, a separation of school and state, which is ridiculous because it more deeply embeds the state in the process. Now, how does it do that? Well, it puts private schools on the voucher dole. So once a, once a private school, which presumably is independent prior to that, some, except for licensing laws, of course, but it, it, once it starts receiving the vouchers, it's got an influx of new students. That means more buildings have to be built, more classrooms, hire new teachers, uh, more administrators, more bureaucracy. Uh, well, what are the chances that that private school is down the line going to say, OK, we're ready to phase out of this voucher program? It, it's The chances are virtually non-existent. So what you end up doing with the voucher program is you more deeply embed the state into the educational process. And so those are the principal reasons why vouchers are such a disaster. Okay, so, and thank you for that. And again, folks, just so people at home don't get confused and people may remember I had Corey DeAngelis on and I was hitting him hard, Corey being like one of the leading people now, you know, from a libertarian perspective, advocating for what he calls school choice. Um, his slogan is, is uh, you've probably seen this, Jacob, is fun students, not systems, I think. And again, that's that's very catchy, but you you could use that with, you know, like you say, like people getting food stamps or something, you know, like fun bellies, not corporations or something. And most libertarians would realize like, whoa, that's kind of emotional language to obscure what's going on here if we're taking money from taxpayers. Um, but for the purpose of this interview, Jacob, let me sort of play the other side devil's advocate and try to push back because I, because I, again, this is a hot button issue and I, and I know what the libertarians who are for what they call school of choice would say. So for example, just on the issue of the non-aggression principle, like in terms of making this, you know, a, a moral issue, they would say, if, if we had been starting from scratch and we had a free market in education, then yeah, we wouldn't favor the introduction of property taxes to then fund 
students who can't afford the private school tuition, you know, clearly. But that's not where we're starting from, Jacob. We're starting from the government already is taking those months, you know, the, the property taxes or whatever it is, which is a violation of the NAP, no question about it. They're already doing that. That's that's a done deal. That's happening. And now the question is just, are we giving parents more say in how the money is being spent on their kids? So if we don't do the vouchers, it's not like the property taxes are getting eliminated. Those p- people are still being taxed. And now it's just the parents of kids, you know, the, the money's being spent on those kids going to the government school, I'll call, I'll call them government schools instead of public, rather than private ones. And so there, there's no issue here on the margin the theft is the same in either scenarios, just we're given more uh, discretion to parents to say, how is that money being spent ostensibly on their children's behalf? Well, it's the same thing we were talking about with respect to slavery, sitting there and saying, look, we've got the slave system. And why do we want to waste our time calling for freedom? We know freedoms, people are not ready for freedom. So let's just spend our efforts here working within slavery and getting better work conditions and, and better health care. Uh, well, well, I would argue that that's morally illegitimate, that would the slaves be grateful? Of course they'd be grateful. But leave, let's leave that to the conservatives. Let's, let's leave reform of slavery to the conservatives. Let us libertarians stand for liberty. The more libertarians that are standing for genuine liberty, for the abolition of slavery, the better chance we have of eliminating slavery. So it's a disaster when you see it. Now, it's not surprising that Republicans would do this. Republicans threw in, conservatives threw in the towel a long time ago on the welfare state. So they say, okay, we've got the public schooling. How can we save kids in it? How do we, how do we make things better? All right, well, let's see if we can reallocate the tax funds here. We, we acknowledge that it's, that, that it's uh, by force, that people are being forced to fund this system, but let's work within this system. Well, there is no way to reconcile that for a libertarian with a non-aggression principle. I mean, the minute you accept this as a given, the system, and you say, I want to make it better, you have accepted a violation of the non-aggression principle. Uh, there, there's no way around that. The only way to, to stay consistent with the non-aggression principle is to say, I don't accept any of this. I, I don't need to tell you how to make your public school system work. I don't need to, how to figure out how to make it work so that it saves some children. Um, All you have to do is say, I'm going to make the case for genuine liberty. And absent that, if you settle for accepting the status quo and you you make that case in your speeches and your arguments for we're going to reallocate tax funds, there is no possible way you're going to be able to reconcile that with the non-aggression principle. Now, for some, the non-aggression principle is not important. For conservatives, it's not important. But for libertarians, it's our core principle. Once a person decides to say, well, I'm just going to violate it. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to, the end justifies the means. I'm saving this kid from the public school system. I'm putting him in this private school. Once you go down that road, then you have effectively abandoned the core principle of libertarianism. And that that sort of leaves you rudderless as far as I'm concerned. You, you're now a libertarian, but you're you're just roaming around, uh, um, meandering, uh, adopting all kinds of reform measures uh, to to really try to make the welfare warfare state work more efficiently. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, too, just I want to amplify the point you made a few minutes ago when you were saying, far from helping to phase out government's footprint in education, the voucher system just you know enmeshes it even more more tightly. Um, I think one particular mechanism by which that would happen is, or does happen, is it's not, if there's going to be a voucher program, there have to be some sort of standards, right? You just can't put a, you know, hang, hang a sign outside your door that, you know, says Bob's, uh, edu- you know, K through 12 education. And then I get all the, the checks from the voucher program and I just have kids come and play video games all day and I give them Fritos and say, yeah, I'm a school like most, you know, voucher programs, there are, you know, standards by which they can, you know, that to show that, no, I'm, I'm, I am sending the student to a qualifying private school that, you know, is, is a deserving recipient of, of these funds. And so, you know, once you just have any of those standards at all, then that sort of spells the death knell because, you know, in other words, had, they, had there not been a voucher program, the private schools 
would have had more leeway to teach what they wanted. But now if they start having students there who, you know, get government funding effectively, then the government does have a say in what can be taught at these schools. And so that's like another, you know, mechanism, I, I would think at least theoretically, that this further solidifies the government's control over what gets taught. Oh, it's a tremendous point. Uh, it's uh, he who pays the piper is going to call the tune. Uh, as you point out, the government's not just going to give away money to whoever wants to call himself a school. Uh, the government's going to have to control what goes into that curriculum. I mean, the, uh, the, the classic example is Hillsdale College. I mean, Hillsdale College was totally independent of government control. It would not accept any government funds at all because it knew that with government money comes controls. Uh, well, the, the government, the federal government took the position that because Hillsdale students took government grants, that they could control the admissions department. And so Hillsdale said, okay, then there's a simple solution to that. We will stop our students from accepting any government grants. And they raised the money entirely voluntarily, which, which shows that things really do work voluntarily. People will donate to schools and education that they think are valuable. Um, and so Hillsdale remained totally independent of government control. And so you're right, with vouchers come control. And so a, a school that, that was previously independent is now going to find itself uh, having to submit to controls and regulations uh, from either the state government or the federal government or what have you. And this is totally opposite to what we want as libertarians. Now, now notice something else that, that I mentioned earlier, and, and we apply it, apply it here. When libertarians or conservatives go out and make the case for vouchers, making that case is totally different from making the case for educational liberty. I mean, you're out there telling people and assuring people that their public school system, which they're wedded to, will remain in existence. And all you're doing is improving it through choice and competition. Those are their favorite terms, choice and competition. And that this will provide a means by which to push the public schooling into doing better. Now, in the early days, uh, well, like back in 1990, which was the first year the Future of Freedom Foundation was operating, I wrote a piece called Letting Go of Socialism, which where I said that voucher proponents are just trying to make a socialist system work more efficiently. Well, Milton Friedman, lo and behold, a Nobel Prize winning economist, took me to task in a speech he gave that was later reduced to an article uh, called uh, Say No to Intolerance that people can read online, where he said, well, look, I'm just advocating, vouchers are a way to get to educational liberty that, that Jacob's talking about, but they really aren't. I mean, if we look at Milwaukee, for example, it's 30 years now that they've had vouchers there. And now, if it were gradually going to get rid of public schooling, 30 years, you would assume, is a gradual period uh, and much, much longer than gradual. Uh, public school is more deeply embedded in Milwaukee than ever. And so th the idea is that if you're going to make the case for liberty, the argument is totally different because now you're challenging people's premises. Their premise of believing in public schooling is being questioned. And mm -hmm. people find that threatening, obviously. Change scares people. But that's why making the case for liberty is so much more difficult sometimes because it doesn't accept the continuation of the infringement that people are accustomed to and feel comfortable with. Okay, I'm glad you brought the Milwaukee case in. That was in. And, and folks, go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 248 and I'll link to all these things we're talking about, including some of Jacob's more recent articles on this stuff. I'll see if I can find the Milton. What, what, what did you say that was? Milton Friedman? Say no to intolerance. And it, it's in a, an issue of Liberty Magazine okay. back, I guess, in 1990. Um, and I, but I think if you just Google it, there's another website that has it as well. They probably uh, have the text. Say no to intolerance, mm -hmm. Milton Friedman. And you were the intolerant one? Is that what? Yeah, yeah. well, what was great <laughs> was it was the first year we got started. So here, now what's interesting is that Friedman said, I want to point out that the Future of Freedom Foundation is doing great work. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is awesome. And, but then he takes me to task for this, this right, piece. Right, right. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, on the Milwaukee piece, so yeah, and one of your recent things, you, you, and I can make sure people got your point, is to say, look, at if, if the ostensible point of this, you know, the 
the more practical, reasonable libertarians who understand how these things work, um, if they're if they're saying that yeah, we all agree separation of uh, school and state is the end goal here, Jacob, but you're being unreasonable and practical. You can't just you just sound like crazy. The, you know you won't even be part of the conversation. What we're going to say is vouchers is an intermediate step, introduces competition, helps students in the in the near term. But then it, it pushes us towards, you know, it expands the Overton window, whatever metaphor you want to use. And then you're saying, well, they've had a voucher program up and running in Milwaukee for 30 years at this point. And does anyone want to, you know, make the case that that's why the government run schools in Milwaukee are, you know, on their last leg right now because they've just been hammered by all the forces of, and you, clearly the answer is no. Well, absolutely. But it's even worse than that that now many voucher proponents actually make the case for vouchers, not as Friedman did, that this would lead to educational liberty, but that this will improve the public school system through competition and choice. So that's their justification for vouchers is keep the public school in existence. We're going to make it better and everybody's going to be happy. You've got the, the state embedded in the private educational system. You've got the state running the public schools. And everything is based on choice and competition. Well, it's not based on choice and competition. And that's where making the case for a genuine separation of school and state is so different. When we talk about choice and competition, we're talking about a system where the government plays no role. There's no compulsory attendance laws. Nobody is forced to choose between a public school and a and a public a private school and a public school or homeschooling. Everybody's managing their own educational decisions the way they ha- they they handle their religious decisions. Uh, some parents will raise their children in ways that other people don't approve of, like they they do with respect to religion. We need to develop a tolerance for that. But now you've got a genuine free market system. Now you got genuine choice. Genuine competition where entrepreneurs are vying, countless entrepreneurs are vying with new educational vehicles coming into existence every day saying, here, go with mine. No, go with mine. Go with mine. The same thing we do in a, we see in a free market. Um, the, and the consumers are sovereign. They are the ones that are deciding who stays in business and who doesn't stay in business. Uh, competition becomes a discovery process, as, as Hayek said of which educational vehicle is the best. And then you get to treat each child differently as a unique, because we know that children are different from each other, even when they come from the same family. One child may want to just spend all day playing the piano. Another child may want to spend all day studying dinosaurs. Well, this enables a parent to craft educational decisions that are that are suited for each individual child rather than this cookie cutter mold and public schooling where every child's treated exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So that's why making the case for the free market, a genuine separation of school and state is so much different. Um, And um, I want to point out that we published really the landmark book in this area. It's called Separating School and State, uh, How to Liberate America's Families by Sheldon Richmond, who Mm -hmm. is a very renowned libertarian scholar. And I would say that any libertarian that wants to make the case, the libertarian case on education, should buy that book because that shows you how to make the case. And I, what, I'm, what I suspect is that a lot of libertarians settle for vouchers because it's sort of the, the lazy person's way to advance liberty, which, again, I don't think is advancing liberty, but that's the way it's couched. It makes It's much more difficult to study up and say, how should I make the case for educational liberty separating school and state. And that requires some study and homework and crafting arguments and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, on the Milwaukee issue, so I, I did um, talk to Corey and, and he said I could use his name. <coughs> and so his his position on that stuff is to say, yes, of course, there's still government schools in Milwaukee, but he's saying there are several studies showing that once those those voucher programs were up and running, that not only was that better outcomes, and I don't know how that's measured again, presumably SAT scores, things like that, for the kids that left the the government system, but even for those who remained behind, that the you know the the threat of competition made the the public schools better. 
And so, so that's that, that was his position. Like in other words, he he views Milwaukee as a feather in his cap to say, yeah, the studies show it was better for students who went who took advantage of the vouchers, and even the ones that for whatever reason didn't take advantage of that program. Um, the 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 threat of that outside competition made the government schools perform better. So, Jacob, what what's your problem here? That very well may be. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't argue that that necessarily didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're going back to the slavery example that, you know, fewer lashings and better health conditions and better food improved a lot of the slaves. Great. Uh, I mean, I I don't have any argument with that. People over there making these reform arguments and people that say vouchers improves public schools. That very well may be the case. But here's the big problem, Bob. It's not freedom. And, And the voucher proponents have spent you know, the ones that are my age have spent the last 30 years really advocating reform. And and where are they now? Okay, suppose the public schools are better. Suppose the private schools are better. Who cares? I mean, if, if, if all you care about is making the serfdom system better, more efficient, great, more power to you. That's not what I'm in this for. I'm a libertarian. I'm in this because I want freedom. Just the same way if I'd been in Alabama in 1855, you're out there telling me that you got fewer lashes for slaves. Great. You got better health care for slaves. Great. That's not why I'm here in 1855, Alabama. I'm here for freedom. And so I say, let, leave the, the reform uh, elements to the, to the conservatives. You know, they're, they're good on that. They've accepted the premises of the welfare warfare state. They believe in it. Uh, let them reform this socialist system. Let us libertarians be the ones really advocating for liberty. The more libertarians we have out there advocating for liberty, the better shot we have at discovering the critical mass that's needed to bring this paradigm shift. Uh, Imagine this. Suppose we have a a nation of 100,000 libertarians, Mm -hmm. and 80,000 of them are calling for vouchers, and 20,000 are calling for liberty making the case for educational liberty. Well, those 20,000 are having to find more people to reach whatever the critical mass is to bring the shift in the the paradigm. Reverse the numbers. Suppose you've now got 80,000 libertarians making the case for genuine liberty, educational liberty, and 20,000 making the case for vouchers. Well, now the dynamics are totally different. Now you got 80,000 libertarians out there finding the, the additional libertarians that bring the critical mass that brings the paradigm shift. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the paradigm shift. I'm not interested in accepting the status quo and being happy with an improved serfdom. That, that has no appeal to me whatsoever. Well, uh, yeah, this is good stuff. And I, this is a point, I'm, I'm, I, I know what I'm trying to say. And to me, I see it very clearly, but I, I, I can tell from the reaction when I make these points that a lot of people aren't getting it. So it's maybe, let's see, at least if, if you get what I'm trying to get across here, Jacob. A lot of times in these arguments, people act as if, you know, you or I are a senator and that our, what we do is really going to be decisive when it's like, no, whether I am for vouchers or for complete liberty or whether I'm for, you know, a Stalinesque system, on the margin, my impact is fairly small. And so that's why I personally say I think I make the most impact by advancing, you know, the the case, like you say, the the somewhat difficult case for full blown liberty, be you know, that's to me, that's where I have the the comparative advantage, and that's what I do. And and you know, I don't just take it for granted that well, public opinion is what it is. Well, well, no, public opinion changes over time, and how does that happen? It's because there are people making the case, and you know, all sorts of other things involved. And so it's you know, what what other I do is not going to change much in the next year. And I'm just saying though. In terms of the impact I have on the conversation, I think me making a more consistent case for full-blown liberty, even if in the beginning a lot of people say, well, that's just too radical, that's impractical. Still, though, like you're saying, I'm going to grab a bunch of 17-year-olds who are just getting into this stuff, and they're going to see the consistency, and then they may, you know, that might make them a lifetime libertarian, small l, and, then, and you know, that my article might be the thing that catches them, whereas, yeah, someone just wanting to shave around the edges and have a, a, a cheaper, more efficient socialism, that's not going to change anybody's life. Uh, that, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you never know the impact of the power of ideas. It, it is impossible to predict. One person making the principal case for liberty 
can sometimes have an impact that he can't ever predict or measure. Uh, for example, I told you that I discovered libertarianism. I was a, a Democrat, liberal. I believe that government should be helping the poor. It, it, it shocked me that people would object to the government using its own money to help the poor. Mm -hmm. And I walk into this public library in my hometown of Laredo, Texas. I was a practicing lawyer at the time. I was in my late 20s. I see these four little books. I start. I open them up. They were called Essays on Liberty. They'd been published by the Foundation for Economic Education 20 years before. Um, and that was an organization, the first real libertarian or one of the first libertarian economics or, uh, organizations still in existence. Uh, it was headed by a man named Leonard Reed. And if you'd asked Reed in the 1950s, uh, Leonard, what impact have, have these four little books had? He couldn't say, well, not much impact right now, but 20 years from now, they're going to be discovered by a young lawyer in Laredo, Texas, and they're going to change the course of his life. You don't know the impact of ideas on liberty. Uh, you, you share an idea with your neighbor. You think, oh, well, it's just one person. It has a rippling out effect. Um, and so I say you got to stand for, for liberty regardless, regardless of sentiments. Now, I'm not saying start arguments at family gatherings over Thanksgiving, over the dinner table and stuff. I'm saying that whenever somebody's seeking what the answer is to the chaos that we have, and let's face it, the educational system is what Mises, Ludwig von Mises would have called planned chaos, that when people are asking, what do you think the solution is? Don't compromise. Say, well, there's only one solution, and that's to separate school and state. If, if they ask for more, then be prepared to make the case. And that means getting prepared in advance. Leonard Reed used to talk about that. He says, you know, the, the best thing you can do is spend time on yourself, improve yourself, work to understand liberty better, because we're all students when it comes to it, so that when people seek your advice or seek information, you can make the case competently. Because nothing worse can befall a good cause, as someone once said, than to have it ineptly defended. And so if we have a lot of libertarians out there expertly making the case for educational liberty, we improve the chances. Now, there's people saying there's no chance of achieving liberty, Bob. I'm throwing in the towel. It's just too big. Public sentiment is against us, and I'm just going to settle for reform. Okay, that's fine. But for me, there's always a chance. You never know what tomorrow can bring. Things may be bad today. But you know, never know what tomorrow can bring. Tomorrow can bring a paradigm shift. And that requires a critical mass in society that want to be free. And that critical mass can be much less than a majority. It's just it takes a principled, passionate, dedicated minority that shoves across the, 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 the goal line and, and changes the paradigm. And that's what we really are all about as libertarians. We want a paradigm shift. We don't want a warmed over serfdom. What do we want a warmed over serfdom for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Jacob. This might be confusing some people. Are you are you more talking about um, you know what you're going to spend your time and what you think like professional libertarians should be spending their time on in terms of their official like this is the goal versus you know their private preferences as to what happened? So for an analogy. I certainly had a view when it was Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump over which I wanted to win, but I didn't vote for either of them. I, I, in fact, I didn't vote. Like that's not where I am in my thinking is, is I just, I don't vote in presidential elections. But if I had, I wouldn't have voted for either of them. I would have voted for a third party candidate, even though I, to me, like I was rooting for one versus the other. I'll leave that up to the listeners to guess which one. But is, so is it like, if you saw a voucher, programs winning referenda or whatever in different cities are you would you be dismayed or is it just say are you just saying oh you know that that might help the kids good for them but in terms of what i'm doing in my messaging i want to be you know to show that that's not the goal i wouldn't i don't i don't care i okay. mean it, to me it's just uh, voucher proponents winning I, i'm just totally indifferent that because that's not going to bring me freedom in fact it may bring me away from freedom because it more deeply embeds the state in education. And, and, and look, uh, Bob, look what happens. Let's, let's assume that, that these guys are right, that are advocating vouchers, that it, it has improved the system. Where does that leave them? I mean, doesn't it leave them worse off with respect to liberty? How do you 
get to a point where you call for the dismantling of a system that you're claiming has been successful. Now you've got a vested interest in keeping the voucher system in permanently. You will never call for liberty because people are going to think you're crazy. You're over here saying this has been a great success. And and maybe it has been a success in terms of improving the plight of, of some kids. How are you ever going to get to dismantling the system? What, will you all of a sudden wake up one morning and start giving speeches on why you should dismantle the system that you've worked so hard to get and be, that you've told so many people is a great success? So when I see these stories, I'm indifferent to it. Mm-hmm. I, I want freedom. That When I hear somebody making the case for liberty, my heart starts to thump a little bit harder. That's the person I want to hear. That's the person I want to support, not the person that's trying to improve the system and make it a permanent, a permanent serfdom, right. not rather than a temporary mm-hmm. one. Um, I think maybe one way to get the, the the libertarian types who are, you know, they can they get what you're saying, but they're like, you know, okay, fine, but you're being kind of a pure. I think maybe one way to drive home the some of the issues and to show that this isn't just you know abstract theorizing is like when it comes to the issue of, of religious schools that. You know, if if the voucher rule were to say, oh no, it has to just be a purely secular education, well then I think a lot of religious libertarians would see the the danger there. That then, oh, and the, when the, when the dust settles, that might mean religious based schools, you know, lose out because now you know they, if they don't if they're not eligible for the funding. But then if the voucher rule says, oh no, it can be you know it can be a religious school, a private school, that that's fine. I mean, what if it turns out that there's you know some Muslim school teaching jihad? And you, know, and you could imagine a lot of taxpayers saying, what, my money is, is funding this. Are you kidding me? Right. And so there would have to be limits in place. And then, okay, well, what if a bunch of taxpayers say, what, they're, they're going to this uh, Christian school and they use the Bible and, and uh, you know, it, that teaches very patriarchal roles for men and women. Look at the, the, the garden story in the beginning blames, you know, sin on, on the woman. I, I don't want my tax dollars funding that. So it's, it, there's a lot of issues that get raised when you start allowing tax dollars to fund things. It's all politicized. Mm-hmm. And, and there's no way to reconcile the fights. I mean, you have you have horrible fights because it's all politicized. And the only way to resolve it is through majority vote. You know, getting your people elected to the school board. I mean, let's say there's a Muslim enclave, then they get all their people elected to the school board. And they say, well, we're gonna we're gonna teach uh, Islam in this public school here. I mean, how do you reconcile that? How, how do you reconcile the fight? Now, now, let me give you another twist based on what you said earlier about, hey, we've got the system in place and let's let's make it better. Uh, suppose things had worked out differently in the religion area. Suppose uh, instead of the First Amendment, the, the founding fathers had said, we're going to have the, the federal government have a church system. They're going to run a church system. We're going to mandate that every child has to be sent to church every Sunday and uh, compulsory church attendance laws. It's going to be funded by church taxes. Um, And that's been our system for 200 and some odd years. All right, so what would we do now as libertarians? Well, the voucher proponents would say, well, Jacob, it's here. We, We really don't have an effective choice. We got to accept it. Let's just put a voucher program in in place here in the church system, which which would enable people to take their kids out of the public churches and put them in the private churches and think how better off children would be. For me, ah, I want to be making the case, and I want libertarians to be making the case for for religious liberty, for getting the the, the state entirely out of the the religion business and, and just hammer away at that principle rather than settle for the fact that the, the federal government is going to be permanently involved in, in the religion arena. Mm-hmm. Let me um, do one more from the, you know, the, the, the pro voucher camp. An argument I've seen them make is to say, you know, Jacob and people who think like you, if you're right, you know, if, if the voucher system is really just socialism light and this really just kind of ensures that the government will have a footprint in education, maybe even a bigger one, because now they can more insidiously get their tentacles into the private school curricula, then why is it that all these heads of the teachers' unions and whatever, they're so terrified of voucher systems? Why do they demonize proponents of vouchers so much if really we're just giving them, you know, we're just, we're just ensuring their control for the next 50 years? Well, because they're, they're, uh, they're, they're threatened. Their stream of income is threatened. 
Because if more people take the vouchers and put their kids in public schools, that means less students in the public school system. And that threatens the teachers and the teachers unions. If if there's less students in a public school and more students in a, in a voucher funded private school, why wouldn't this teacher object? I mean, this is a the, like I'm not here defending public schooling right, by right. any means. Mm-hmm. This, this is a racket. I mean, it's a socialist racket. And so any threat to that system is going to create animosity. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the system that is threatening them is a good system. Uh, mm. it, 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 it very well could be that the whole system's rotten to the core. I mean, that's, that's what I think it is. Uh, this, this notion that because the teachers are objecting that that necessarily means that vouchers are good, I think is, is quite illogical. Right. And actually, yeah, to amplify your point too, like it's no one, you could be arguing that, yeah, it, it hurts the interest of the public school teachers perhaps, why, you know, to flip the, the argument back on them, if you guys are having all the success in introducing voucher programs in city after city, how come the mayors are all going along with it? You know, you know in other words, right? So in other words, it's the people in the government at some level, maybe not, yes, the, the head of the teacher's union at the government school, but various government officials are okay with it. Otherwise, these programs wouldn't be getting inaugurated. And so you could just flip it on them and say, why are they agreeing to it if this is really the way to phase out government control? That seems kind of funny that they're, you know, hanging themselves with the noose. Um, can I, can I, Jacob, just if we put aside the the um, voucher issue and just back up, you keep mentioning the welfare warfare state. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you were one of the few people right after 9-11 who, stuck your neck out and, you know, was, were against like a, a bellicose U.S. response to just saying, we got to bomb these people back in the Stone Age. My, is my memory right? It's absolutely right. I mean, for, for one thing, we were one of the ones pointing out, the few ones pointing out that the 9-11 attacks were a direct res- blowback, as, as the term is used, retaliation for what the U.S. government had been doing in the Middle East prior to the 9-11 attacks. They'd been killing people. I mean, they had a killing machine there in the Middle East, specifically on Iraq. They were killing Iraqi children with their sanctions. Uh, Madeleine Albright, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, imagine this, actually publicly declares, this is the official spokesman for the, the U.S. government to the world, that the deaths of half a million Iraqi children from the sanctions was worth it. I mean, that, that's just shocking, but you know, nobody condemns her for it. I mean, because presumably because they all agreed with her. Well, so we kept saying at the FFF, we weren't the only ones. Uh, Chalmers Johnson, um, great um, analyst on foreign policy, he wrote a book called Blowback before 9-11 that says, if you continue on this course, you continue this killing machine in the Middle East, you're going to get a major terrorist attack on American soil. And you had you had signs of it. It didn't take a rocket scientist. You had the 1990 theory attack on the World Trade Center, which was, a, in principle, the same thing that happened you know, eight years later. You had uh, the, uh, the guy that went in uh, and murdered CIA agents right near CIA headquarters. That was in retaliation for what was going on in the Middle East. He even said that in his sentencing. And then you, you've got uh, Ramsey Youssef that was involved in the 93 attack. He said the same thing. This is, this is because of your foreign policy, and he included the Iraqi children in that. You had the attack on the USS Cole. You had the attack on the e- embassies in East Africa. This is all pre-9-11. So when 9-11 comes, we were the first ones to say, you see? And immediately we were inundated with attacks because the government's official line was, oh, no, no, we're innocent that they attacked us because they hated our freedom and values. And we said, no, it's because they hate your killing machine. You got to stop your killing machine. So if you buy the freedom and values argument, well, then they're going to invade Afghanistan and kill multitudes of people. They're going to invade Iraq and kill multitudes of of people, 99% of whom, Bob, had nothing to do with 9-11. You're going to reach massive death and destruction. And we were saying this, that this is the worst possible thing you can do is invade these countries. Um, but, you know, that they did mm-hmm. it anyway. And here we are today where we've gone, come full circle. We have the so-called war on terrorism. And it's a great big racket where the, the warfare state is benefiting. Uh, the, the Pentagon budget's higher than ever. Even they're out of Afghanistan and, and not using all those bombs and missiles and tanks and stuff. 
their budget's bigger than ever. Uh, we've gone full circle on the Cold War. We've got a, a crisis ginned up with Russia. We got a, they're ginning up a crisis with China. But they got the best of all worlds, crises with Russia and China, Cold War, war on terrorism, uh, then lesser official enemies like North Korea and Iran and Syria. I'm, I'm only surprised why they haven't thrown Vietnam into the mix here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's an absolute, unmitigated, deadly, and just highly dangerous in terms of, of getting closer to nuclear war game that they're playing here. And the only solution out of this morass is libertarianism. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no other solution. People need to recognize that. Well, yeah, well put. And I'm partly bringing that up because I, I do remember, like, you know, I was writing for LouRockwell.com at the time. We, you know, we were one of the outlets that, so, so folks were, in case people who were young and weren't there, right after 9-11, like, it was considered like you were a pay, you were a traitor if you said anything about, you know, hey, maybe the U.S. kind of, you know, did some things and this isn't a surprising retaliation. You know, it was just, you know, oh, so you're blaming the victim. You're saying it's our fault. OK, you know, and it was um, so it, there were a lot of people on the right that were against U.S. foreign policy, but they kept their mouths shut for a while. And like I say, Jacob, I, I remember that, you know, your organization was one of the few that right out of the gate, you know, on September 12th. We're, we're saying, you know, what eventually became a standard view among non-interventionists, but they kind of kept their head down for a while until it was safe to say things like that. It, it was a nasty environment. I've never gotten so much hate mail and cancellations of support in, in the 32-year history. And, and I remember that Lou was right in there. Lou, Lou and FFF, Mises Institute, LouRockwell.com, we were right there together. In fact, Lou and I became really good friends because... We were holding lonely ground during that period of time. Uh, you're right. We were being called traitors and terrorist lovers and defenders of terrorism. And I mean, it was all this pure nonsense. Uh, but um, it, it, those were tough times for us. But ultimately, I think mm-hmm. we were vindicated. Uh, yeah. You know, look what's happened with Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's just horrible. Mm-hmm. And I guess to bring it full circle in terms of the general theme of this discussion you're you know, saying at the time, like there could have been a lot of people saying, don't just say, you know, don't bring up blowback. That's going to alienate 90% of American listeners. You know, just talk about how, you know, we can't just go bombing indiscriminately. Like let's, let's, you know, invade, let's take out the Taliban. Okay. But maybe going into Iraq is not the right thing to do in response. Since they really didn't have anything to do with 9-11. Like th- those arguments are better than the people that say, let's just, you know, melt everybody over there. But in terms of giving a principled, consistent response that, yeah, the, there, had, there was a role for people to say what the truth was, even though a lot of Americans didn't want to hear it for a few years. That's exactly right. And, and, and we were given that principled case that if you invade Afghanistan, this thing's going to be an absolute disaster. But, but worst of all, you're going to end up wreaking death and destruction against people that had nothing to do with 9-11. I mean, if Al Qaeda did it, and, and U.S. officials have never really proven that Al Qaeda did it. Um, I mean, there's much more evidence that the Saudi regime, right. that murderous regime, was behind this thing. But if they did do it, there was other ways to deal with the problem. I mean, like Ramsey Youssef. Remember, I mentioned he was the guy that that was one of the guys behind the 1993 attack. They found him in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't know, two or three years later after the attack. Well, they didn't invade Afghanistan. They didn't go and drop bombs on Afghanistan. They waited them out. They watched. They they looked real carefully. And they went in there, swooped in, and they had him arrested with the help of the Pakistani authorities. And they brought him back to the United States for trial. Uh, and we have to remember, terrorism is a criminal offense. It's not an act of war. And, and that was proven by the fact that they put Youssef on trial. And they convicted him. The guy's sitting in a federal penitentiary even today. Um, and the other guy that killed the CIA agents, they, they gave him the death penalty. Um, but that's what they could have done with, with Osama bin Laden. If they were convinced that bin Laden was behind the thing, wait him out, watch, wait for intelligence, figure out a way that you can bring him back to the United States for trial. But to invade an entire country and kill multitudes of people and destroy their infrastructure and destroy their businesses and homes – that's just nightmarish. I mean, they're just morally illegitimate. And and notice that at some point they were saying, we're doing this for the Afghan people. We're bringing them freedom. You know, I forget, in, enduring freedom or something like that. Well, I guarantee you they were not bringing freedom to the people they were killing. Uh, and those people are dead. 
Um, so it, it, that was the thing we needed to do, Bob, is question the morality of what was happening here, especially because it was their foreign policy in the first place that gave rise to the anger and hatred that was motivating the terrorist attacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and like like we say, just to tie us all together, that it's even though at the time it would seem like, oh, you're just being too strident. Come on, Jacob. Yeah, read the room. Come on. This this is not the place for they, you know, the, the towers just came down. You know how many people. But again, if it's true, and like you say too, it's not, you're not merely saying you're a better strategist and you can better forecast the future. Your point was, no, it's dropping bombs on people who had nothing to do with 9-11. That is immoral. So that's full stop, you know, and, and you, as a student of history, you can make predictions about this is not going to go well for other reasons too. But in terms of is this a good policy or not? No, it violates the NAP. So there you go. Right, and and you know we often forget the worldwide sympathy for America after nine eleven. I mean, the whole world was with us, and man, that fell apart as soon as they invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, then now half the world hated us, and it became. Mm-hmm unsafe for Americans to travel in the Middle yeah. East. I mean, you didn't know who was going to retaliate. And the, another classic example of this was Ron Paul. When, when Ron Paul was in that famous debate, uh, Republican primary debate, and all the Republican <laughs> candidates said, well, they came over here and, and invaded us because they hate us for our freedom and values. And Ron says, well, that's just pure nonsense. They came over here to kill us because our government's over there killing them. I mean, the whole room went ballistic. Iran got attacked. And I remember viciously and booing. And, and I, it was a Republican audience. And I remember watching this saying, Ron, you heroic guy, but mm-hmm. you are dead in the water now. Well, boy, was I wrong because that's when Ron's campaign took off. There was a large segment of Americans that instinctively knew he was telling the truth, that it was mm-hmm. this was blowback from U.S. foreign policy. And that's when Ron Paul became a real threat to become president in that 2008 campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that Giuliani, Giuliani moment, as people refer to it, was amazing. Okay, yeah. well, that's probably as, as good a place as any to wrap up this particular discussion. Um, folks, my guest today has been Jacob Hornberger. Uh, Jacob, thanks so much for your time. In parting, is there anything, any place you want to point the listeners to when I'll read more about your work? Uh, the best thing to do is just come to FFF.org and subscribe to our FFF Daily, free for the asking. And thank you, Bob. I greatly enjoyed the conversation with you. Yeah, same here. Thanks for taking the time to do this. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.